Hey, good Sunday morning, boys and girls in the YouTube world, and all you firearms gurus out there. I'll tell you what a couple of weeks it's been. Uh, I'm spending about two hours a day packing up orders, and probably at least another hour and a half to two hours a day uh, searching on the internet, <clears throat> mostly my wholesale houses, to see what's in stock and what isn't. I'm still coming up with a lot of zeros. I mean, there's people that are getting into reloading that have never reloaded before. And, you know, to be truthful with you, I guess it's great that they are getting into reloading. Problem is, I can't get them all the supplies they need. <clears throat> um, in the last couple of weeks, I've already shipped out about 6,000 bullets. Most of those are 9 millimeters. Uh, I've uh, lost my supply on my 30, 30, 150 grain flat point bullets. Uh, however, I can get the F, FTX, the flex tip bullets, the Hornady flex tip bullet. They're a lot more expensive. There's still a lot of hunting bullets around. Just as, you know, who wants to spend $35, $40, $60 for a box of 50 or 100 bullets, you know, to go out and just uh, burn holes in paper with. <clears throat> uh, if we took, I have Lee, six Lee Challenger, Breach Locks Challenger press kits that have just come in. One of them's gone already to a guy in Virginia, and he took the last of my 223 brass in the 62 grain 223 bullets I had. I do have coming in probably in about a week 5,147 grain 30 cal bullets. They're full metal jacketed. These are pulled bullets. I'll be offering them at a fairly reasonable rate. Um, I tried to get the fellow I purchased them off of the bump down a few pennies of bullets. He, he, you know, it was hard for him to do it because his margin's so close, and I won't be selling them at a at a great increased profit either. I mean, I like to realize, you know, thirty percent on some of my stuff. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, when you're paying six bucks for a roll of tape and you're burning through a roll of tape, you know, uh, uh, you know, every three or four days, then you know all those things add up, and back and forth, and dropping packages off, and delivery, and printing, and shipping, that all adds up a little bit. Even though the customer pays for it, it's still adds up on my end as well. Uh, I wrote uh, an article, uh, a note that hopefully will appear in its entirety in the New York State Muzzle Loaders Association newsletter. And what I'm going to do is, <clears throat> I'm going to try to read part of it here, a uh, <clears throat> small portion of it. What it has to do is, uh, all these people in New York have been subject to firearms registrations for over a hundred years in your handgun permit. Not only do you get a permit, uh, they give you a permit, it has your handguns registered on it, which is just totally wrong altogether. In fact, I don't even believe you should need a handgun permit. The excuse is, well, if we catch you with a handgun and, and, and you have a permit, then we know you're a good guy. Uh, yeah, okay, sure. They're still gonna run you through, you know, third, fourth, and fifth degrees. You know, why do you have this? Where are you going? What are you doing? It happens all the time. People wanna deny it. Here's my issue. I need a drink. <clears throat> the United Nations deal and the NRA and all these gun groups out there that are against this uh, small arms treaty from the United Nations and the proliferation of small arms and small arms being sold all around the world and uh, ammunition it's not being stored properly, and this goes from landmines and hand grenades and rockets. Okay, just anything handheld is pretty much what they're running at. Um, the United Nations says, small arms, insurgents, armed gang members, pirates, terrorists, they can all multiply their force through the use of unlawful acquired firepower. The illicit circulation of small arms, light weapons, and their ammunition destabilizes communities and impacts security and development in all regions of the world. End quote. My comment, I read this as, if you do not receive your weapons from a certified source such as the United States State Department or another approved country state, <clears throat> then you don't need them. Yes, they say it in so many, yes, they say it in so many words, almost like, we'll protect and take care of you. Right? They're like the we'll protect and take care of you government we have grown accustomed to. Ah, yeah, that's true, isn't it? One of the biggest problems with a global firearms control is how can all these country states meet and create modern civilized rules for those to follow when, truth be told, most of their countrymen are still living in a mud or a grass hut. All right. 
a large majority of these states. Notice I'm using the word state here for a reason, okay? I want you all to figure that out. Are still fighting to gain control of land, money, food, water. Maybe not in that particular order, but the peoples of the region seem to go from one battle to another in an effort to gain a little better foothold in life. Reading a UN report is like reading a Bible story. Really, it, it really, it really is. The reports tell haunting accounts of bloodthirsty raids and attacks on villages in some in some civilized cities, like they were still living in the eighth century. <clears throat> From January to June 2012, there were 189 attacks aimed at the people, aimed at the people, a government of some sort, military, and not to be forgotten, oil company offices. I get these references from Wikipedia, but actually where they came from, their news reports, okay, from around the world that were all compiled, you know, like the daily, like the stuff we see every day. Bomb went off here, killed 30 people. Bomb went off here, killed 8 people, wounded 200, all right? That's right out of the news reports. <clears throat> Another quote. <clears throat> In January... In 2008, a United Nations group of government experts reported to the General Assembly on problems arising from the accumulation of conventional ammunition stockpiles and surplus. The group noted that cooperation with regard to effect stockpile management needs to endorse a whole life safe handling and storage and for identifying surplus. That means that you have these countries that buy all this ammunition, uh, some rogue agent or the country itself takes the ammo out, buries it somewhere, dumps it in a bunker, and then they kind of forget about it for a while. Lo and behold, some guys stumble along, something happens, they open up the doors, they don't know what's going on. They've got a bunch of uh, ammunition that could be corroding or bad. This includes, you know, hand grenades, landmines, all this stuff. You never know what you're going to hit. They're cashing it away. Oh, dear. Essential for ensuring safe handling and storage and for identifying surplus to, to physical security systems and surveillance and testing procedures to assess the stability and reliability of ammunition. All right, that's what happens. I mean, you know, you know, we all don't live, you know, up here in the United States where the weather's pretty good most of the year. You know, we got people that are living in areas that are out in jungles. You know, I mean, I'm sure things rust pretty quick in the jungle. Now, <clears throat> a central recommendation made by the group was for technical guidelines for the stockpile management of ammunition to be developed within the United Nations. Now, here's another quote. The National Rifle Association's position on the United Nations Arms Tra Trade Treaty, as stated in their March 2013 news release, reads, If signed, the ATT would be, legally, would be a legally binding treaty that would require parties to the treaty to adhere to the treaty's provisions, many of which as proposed in a month-long meeting last July, that would have been 2012 July, are incompatible with our Second Amendment rights. For the treaty to be ratified, it would have to be approved by two-thirds of a vote of the U.S. Senate. During the July ATT conference, NRA conducted a successful campaign to stop the treaty. And we all remember that. We get the calls, call your senator, call this and that. <clears throat> we don't want this to happen anymore. All right? We don't want foreign governments telling us what to do in infringing upon our Second Amendment rights. We don't want foreign governments keeping, in the United Nations, keeping a registry of our firearms. Wait, I'm not done. So, according to another NRA news release, in part, anti-gun treaty proponents continue to misread, mislead the public, claiming the treaty would have no impact on American gun owners. That's a bald-faced lie. This is the NRA quoting. I'm quoting the NRA. This is right out of the NRA, right off their website. For example, the most recent draft treaty includes import-export controls that would require officials in an importing country to collect information on the end user of, the, of a firearm, keep the information for 20 years, and provide the information to the country from which the gun was exported. In other words, if you bought a Beretta shotgun, you would be an end user, and the U.S. government would have to keep a record of you and notify the Italian government about your purchase. This gun, that, that's gun registration. 
if the U.S. refuses to implement this data collection on law-abiding American gun owners, other nations might be required to ban the export of firearms to the U.S. Well, we don't have to worry about other countries banning the export of firearms to the United States because this country is, in, this, in these, a lot of these administrations, not just this one, I'll go all the way back as far as you want to go, seem to have done a pretty good job of banning import, importation, exportation, and now here in New York, we have firearms dealers that won't, and wholesalers and manufacturers that won't even sell firearms in New York any longer because of the firearms ban, better known as everybody still keeps calling it the Safe Act. I call it the Andrew Cuomo firearms ban. Now, <clears throat> the end user. This is where it gets inter interesting. Now I've read a dozen or so UN reports. They're well written, lots of numbers and incidents. So now you're asking, Bill, what does this have to do with New York? In my opinion, why have New Yorkers compromised for over 100 years to handgun registration? How can New Yorkers remotely tolerate the new opt-out forms? Worse yet, how can New Yorkers fill out firearms registrations forms for firearms deemed a weapon of war by the political madness that rules in Albany? Now remember, we have country states. We have states within the United States, and then somewhere I believe it says, I've read somewhere, a free state. All right? That's a free state of being, of, of a person, a free state. All right? Not like a free Colorado, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. A free state. People are in a free state. All right? Not a country state not a state within the United States, a free state. I go on. I mean to say, if the NRA and all those millions of firearms owners and the bipartisan group in Washington, D.C. that are against the United Nations Firearms Trade Treaty, if the pro-firearms group claim the United Nations Treaty violates our Second Amendment rights by registering our firearms to the end user, then how the heck can New York adopt the firearms registration and not one state senator or legislator has pointed this glaring fact out? I mean, explain it to me. If all these people, all these firearms owners, are against firearms registration by the United Nations, our government keeping firearms registrations, which, by the way, they're not allowed to do. That was part of the Brady Act thing. They can't keep the registration of firearms. How can New York continue to collect handgun firearms purchases and registration information? Now they're going to collect long arm firearms serial numbers information and you and registration. The next background check, the National Instant Criminal Background Check that they call the Brady Check, <clears throat> needs an extra, I don't know, million, billion dollars, a couple of million dollars to upgrade your system because now they, everybody, all these states in New York wants you to do uh, background checks on ammunition purchases. Evidently, something's been missed here. I mean, if you're against the United Nations Small Arms Treaty, and that keeps getting shut down, then why do we keep, why are we registering now? Firearms registration violates the Brady Act. That's how I understand it. It's plain and simple, but yet everybody's worried about, oh, the magazine ban, or this ban, or that ban, and law enforcement is exempt from this. Well, why are they exempt? Why are they exempt from anything? You people really got to wake up. If you opt in, if you fill out those opt-out forms, then you're telling every one of those people in New York State that fought to pass that firearms ban, that, hey, this is okay, I like this. It's ridiculous. It's firearms registration. No matter if your town clerk does it, your county clerk does it, the state does it, if the, if the United States federal government does it, 
or if the Italian government is keeping track of your firearm, its firearms registration. All right, now, I read the letter, I mumbled my way through it. <clears throat> if anybody would like a copy of it, you can contact me at www.blackpottergirl.com. I have it up on my blog. Uh, there were some formatting issues. My blog is black, and it should come up with white fonts. And I came up with this white background and all this bizarre formatting. Uh, as I get time, I might try to work on that, though. But uh, <clears throat> my fingers aren't working too well. They're all swollen up from arthritis and stuff. And uh, I'm trying to do limited typing. Again, this is Black Powder Bill at blackpowderbill.com. Come check me out on gumbroker.com as BPBRS, that's Black Powder Bills Reloading Supplies. I'm getting a few things in. You know, I'm trying to keep the people happy. Uh, right now, the big thing is I have those Lee Breach Block Challenger kits. I'm offering them with two extra bushings, $185, and I can get them shipped to you for around $207. I figure $20.25 for shipping, depending on your location. They will come FedEx. I can't ship them to a post office box. Well, I could ship it to a post office box, but we'd have to see what the postage is going to be on them. Um, it's it's the kit. It's it's everything you need to load. It's a powder measure. It's the powder drop, you know. Uh, you've got shell holders. I mean, I can't get shell holders anymore. I think I bought the last six or seven of them here a few months back. You know, give me a shout. I've got a lot of brass coming in. i got 9,200 pieces of brass coming in here in about a week. It'll be 9mm, 45, 40s, and I think some 223 ones fired. I have on back order. I still have 55 grain 223 bullets on back order. I've got 5,147 grain 30 cal full metal jacketed bullets coming in. They were pulled bullets, but these things look like they're, they're brand new. I mean, if you look at some of these bullets, even if they go down a barrel, if you were, you know, if you were frugal enough, I think you could shoot them again. I mean, people shoot reclaimed shot again. I know, well, well, but, you know, what kind of accuracy are you guys really looking for? You know, I mean, I see guys blowing stuff off at, you know, 50, 100, 125, 150 yards. You know, you're poking holes in paper. You're throwing them down range. If you want to get into real accuracy, again, there's still a lot of hunting bullets available. I can grab those for you. So give me a shout, blackpowderbill at yahoo.com, and uh, check out my blog at www.blackpowderbill.com, and my Facebook account as Black Powder Bill. And if you can't remember that, then just go to Google and Google Black Powder Bill, and I'm sure you'll find me. Hey, Black Powder Bill out. It's a beautiful Sunday, and uh, I think I'm going to do something. I don't know. Maybe nothing. I'm going to take it easy today. Black Powder Bill out.